Welcome, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to begin with prayer. Is there a volunteer to help us out? Please. Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful for this day and we're grateful that we can um, come to class and we're grateful for technology, which allows us to um, participate in class with Zoom. And we are very grateful for BYU. We pray that God bless us, that um, as much as possible we can stay healthy and um, then we pray that our minds might be open, that we can learn everything that uh, we should today. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. All right. A um, couple administrative matters. Uh, I have posted the key for quiz one on Learning Suite. So please be aware of that. Also, I have um, posted quiz two. Um, and I have a hard copy of that here, although I only have one TA to pass things out. Um, so uh, we'll get that around. I will continue to bring that over the next couple of days. Um, as to the um, as to when quiz two will be due, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit undecided. I could have you turn it in a week from today or I could have you turn it in a week from Monday. I know the extra time would be appreciated. The, the downside of doing that is I wouldn't post the key until Monday uh, or Tuesday morning uh, for the for quiz two. And some of you might want to look at that prior to taking the exam. Um, I do have a study guide for exam one. And so I will distribute that. Now, this is also posted on Learning Suite. And uh, the, the exam officially begins Thursday of next week and will continue on for several days. I can't remember exactly what the schedule is, but you can check the testing center for that. Okay. I believe this one is Wednesday. Wednesday? Okay. All right. So, um, a lot of paper shuffling uh, right now. So, are there questions about this? Yes. Quiz two is it has a group quiz or do you want to take a group quiz? No, this is, they're all group quizzes. So, hopefully, you um, will uh, still have a group. <laughs> I know that there are some who do not have groups, and I think uh, a number of them would uh, like to be part of a group. Uh, if for no other reason than simply to reduce the workload in, uh, <clears throat> in answering the quizzes. If that is the case, please email me and I will put this out on Learning Suite uh, or some other way to let other students know that um, there is interest in forming one or more additional groups. So, yes. That depends on how far we get. So uh, at the very latest, it would be Friday of next week. Most of this will be done by Wednesday. So other questions? Okay, so um, let's uh, go ahead and begin. We're going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to use a fair number of slides today. I apologize. I know it's a little bit less interesting to do it that way, but um, um, some of this will go better. 
Uh, I will use the board a, a bit when we talk about the Hill equation. And then we'll use slides again if we get as far as talking about the heme group. So please make note, these are the things that we are covering today. Um, so protein folding, chaperones, prion disease, the Hill equation, and if we have time, we will begin talking about the heme group. Okay, so uh, we have spent a lot of time talking or at least putting out the idea that protein function uh, is a product of the shape of the protein and also the chemistry that is presented on the exterior of the protein. So both of these contribute to its overall function within our bodies, within an organism. It's estimated currently that somewhere between a half and maybe two thirds of all proteins fold spontaneously without any assistance. Um, on the other hand, uh, somewhere between a third and a half of the proteins uh, currently are thought to require the assistance of another protein or proteins in the folding process. These proteins that assist with folding are the chaperones that we will talk about in, uh, uh, in a minute or two. This process happens actually remarkably quickly. Uh, so spontaneous folding happens within a few seconds. Uh, of the production of a protein uh, at the level of the ribosome. It is critical that the protein folds correctly. It will have one final three-dimensional low energy structure. This is its native or biologically active form. Um, so uh, in terms of unassisted folding, that's what that's supposed to say. Um, can we get that banner down? There? Um, the first thing to say is that each individual protein folds in exactly the same way every time uh, with, with very little, uh, with very few exceptions. Um, so there is a hierarchical folding of the protein. Most, uh, most proteins undergo what is referred to as hydrophobic collapse. What this simply means is that hydrophobic uh, side groups do not interact favorably with water. You'll recall that. Um, they're not repelled by water. Nevertheless, they don't interact favorably with water and by consolidating or compressing all of those hydrophobic side groups to the interior, you reduce the size of the hydration cage that will need to surround that protein. In other words, we're trying to, if possible, achieve a sphere with our protein to minimize the number of ordered water molecules that have to interface with that protein. This is referred to as hydrophobic collapse. So if you can imagine, the protein doesn't come out fully formed. It comes out as this sort of strand, uh, this sort of uh, flexible polymer of amino acids that comes out of the uh, ribosome, but immediately it's placed in an aqueous environment. So as that happens, you can imagine that the hydrophobic side groups coalesce. That is, they come together to form a cluster, again, to minimize the number of ordered water molecules that surround them. As additional amino acids are added and the polymer is extended, 
this process continues. As you start to push things together, as you have this hydrophobic collapse, you will have a rise secondary structures. So alpha helices, beta sheeting, and these happen for a couple reasons, okay? One is that they are very compact arrangements of amino acids. So if you remember some of the sort of space filling models that we saw, at least of the alpha helix, it was very compact. Another consideration, another important consideration is that the phi and psi angles that can be achieved naturally favor alpha helical or beta sheet structure. Uh, if you remember that strange Ramachandran plot with its blue and gray shading, there were only really a few sets of phi and psi angles that were seen frequently in actual three uh, in actual three-dimensional proteins. And these were consistent with alpha helical or beta sheet structure. Now, obviously there are things that can disrupt alpha helical or beta sheet structure. So not every amino acid is in an a alpha, hel helici alpha helix or a beta sheet. But nevertheless, you start to see those as you push these together because they, they are naturally compact and the angles that can actually be achieved in nature tend to favor those structures. As you do this, so let's say you form now an alpha helix, a rather cylindrical uh, object, and you start to push other proteins against it, there is a tendency for it to propagate that structure. In other words, if you had a second alpha helix, that could be laid parallel and side by side with the original, that would be, uh, that would probably be a, a favorable type of arrangement for amino acids. Put another way, as you start to have alpha helical and beta sheet structure, they tend to seed or tend to propagate out uh, those same structures further deeper into the protein as it folds. And then ultimately uh, there you begin to see, well, uh, you begin to see super secondary structures. And in the end, you have a final overall three-dimensional structure that represents the topography of this folded protein. So its final shape is achieved actually quite quickly. Um, much of it in the, in the millisecond uh, time frame. some of it maybe the final little bit around the uh, outside of the protein may take a few seconds before it achieves its final three-dimensional structure. Now the slide talks about the formation of disulfide bridges. And again, this process is not random. It is ordered and the formation of disulfide bridges always involves the same two cysteines for a given protein. Different, different proteins behave differently in terms of their folding, but for one given protein, it will always be the same pair of cysteines that form a disulfide bridge. Uh, in some proteins, the disulfide bridges are formed early and they seem to constrain the protein. You as you form that covalent bond, it really limits the rotational uh, options in, that you have within the remainder of the polypeptide chain. Some form their disulfide bridges uh, really sort of at the end of the folding process. And it seems to be more like pinning or cementing that structure in place, giving additional strength and, uh, and structural integrity to the final conformation. In some proteins, 
interestingly, form one set of uh, disulfide bridges early on and then form a set later. Uh, again, it's not random. It's always the same uh, cysteines that are involved in the formation both of the early and the late disulfide bridges. But where disulfide bridges uh, exist, they do tend to uh, stabilize three-dimensional structure and constrain that structure due to those covalent bonds between uh, strand portions of the same protein. All right, let me stop here and take questions. Yes? How do they measure the phi and psi angles? Uh, they have to, they would do, uh, so there, if you look in the book, it tries to explain uh, what the phi and psi angles are, but in, in, in the last analysis, it, you have to solve the X-ray crystal structure of a protein and then it has to be at high enough resolution that you can actually observe and calculate those phi and psi angles. So, yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Unassisted spontaneous protein folding. Now, there are those uh, who who are into chaperones that would argue that we underestimate the role of chaperones in protein folding, and that may be true. Uh, maybe after careful analysis, we will find that there are proteins that facilitate or at least protect the protein as it's folding. Um, but right now, the estimates are between 30 and 50% of proteins require a chaperone, and the other half or two thirds fold spontaneously. Yes. So, like, I know the amino acid can be deadly and they can be cut by chains. And so, is there like a time frame that after a few minutes it's spontaneous, or a few hours, or is it random? So, it, so the question, uh, and this, this is one I don't think I can answer, is how quickly does a ribosome produce a poly, uh, you know, a polymer of amino acid? So, the polymer is being formed within the ribosome and you bring in these transfer RNAs one at a time and they uh, relinquish or they contribute their uh, particular amino acid to the growing chain. I don't know what the exact time frame on that is. It must be fairly quick or we'd die, you know, just from, for lack of proteins. But in terms of the folding, it's, it can be microseconds, milliseconds to get the final um, three-dimensional structure. Sometimes there's a little bit of jiggling and, and uh, jostling that takes place over a period of a few seconds. But all in all, this happens quite quickly. It's not ours. So. Other questions? Okay, let's talk then about, oops, where am I? Uh, okay, this, this is, gives you an example of some structural things. This, this one's interesting and I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it and I don't expect you to spend a lot of time on it. But what's interesting here is that this actually has available, this particular protein, and this is rare, but it has two stable structures. And each of these stable structures has a very different biological activity. So uh, this is the exception and, and certainly not the rule, but you can see that on the left, we have uh, just beta sheeting and some random coil. So uh, this, oops, there I am over here. This, all of this in here is beta sheeting. All of this sort of, uh, all this, these amino acids out here are in random, what's called random coil. You'll notice though that the other um, isomeric or the other <coughs> conformer of this protein has alpha helical structure, as well as still some of the beta sheeting down here. So interesting. Okay, let's talk now about assisted protein folding 
There are some, pro, uh, some enzymes that are involved with proline adopting the right conformation. Um, those are undoubtedly important. There are also some uh, enzymes that form or allow for the opening of disulfide bridges. So given that the formation of disulfide bridges is not random, it probably means that the enzyme, these enzymes are probably used frequently in the formation of disulfide bridges. Let's talk about chaperones. So let me sort of uh, direct your attention to the final bullet point there. So these chaperones can assist in protein folding in several different ways. It turns out that one particular type of chaperone typically performs one type of function, but uh, some of these can be fairly minimal interactions with a protein as it folds. In other words, some of these will simply uh, interact with hydrophobic side groups of the forming protein to keep them from aggregating or keep, keep uh, multiple copies of this protein from aggregating, allowing the protein to fold spontaneously, but protecting it in the process. Otherwise, you would uh, perhaps form uh, aggregates and they would precipitate out of solution. Other uh, chaperones actually seem to provide a map. They, they provide a template that actually directs the folding. So they're intimately involved in how things are bent and twisted and turned as the protein adopts its shape. There are others that uh, are important to uh, target and remove misfolded proteins. So there is something called the proteasome, which degrades proteins that are misfolded or have become um, aged and they are removed. There are other uh, chaperones that help move or transport proteins as they fold from one site to another and actually in some cases seem to assist or be important in the assemblage of protein, um, uh, multi-protein complexes. So all of these are really important. Some of these uh, were first discovered in therm uh, thermally stable bacteria called, they were initially called heat shock proteins. And you'll see that designation HSP70 or whatever for a number of bacterial chaperones. This is simply an indication that under very um, severe conditions, external conditions, that these chaperones allowed proteins to remain in solution in their native state. So, okay, so here's a, an example uh, of one where uh, there is a protein, uh, find my little marker here. So the protein uh, initially is here. Uh, it comes out and uh, maybe undergoes some folding so early on. So again, this is sort of the hydrophobic collapse story. We generate some secondary elements, then maybe it comes down and interacts now with this particular protein, which is going to help either stabilize or direct um, further folds within the protein. And uh, this process may happen repeatedly, but ultimately the protein is released in its native form. You can see that if there wasn't uh, the potentially that if this, uh, this newly formed or forming protein doesn't interact with the uh, chaperone that it might then uh, form aggregates um, and these aggregates become insoluble and precipitate out of solution. They become unusable. 
Here is a much more elaborate kind of chaperone system. In fact, it's made up of several different, this is a, a system that's made up of several different proteins. And they form these elaborate uh, sort of barrels. And the barrel has an open cylinder within it. And proteins the, the, in the process of folding will enter in to that chamber, into that central core and be folded. Uh, some of these, so here up here in the left-hand corner is our protein that needs to be folded further. It enters into this cylindrical space. Uh, to, it actually, there is actual molecular motion. This is driven by the use or the consumption of ATP. Uh, in this case, this grow L has this cap, grow ES which sits on top of this and reinforces folding. Sometimes these caps actually bring partially, uh, partially folded proteins to this uh, kind of chamber. At least this is what happens in humans. There's a comparable complex called the CTT. And uh, then that same cap will actually uh, take the folded protein off and allow it to form a complex. So it actually directs its uh, relocation to elsewhere in the cell where, where it'll form a complex. So these are extraordinarily complicated, elaborate uh, systems that uh, allow for protein, protein folding. Now, the substrates for these, that is those proteins that are folded are limited in number. Not every protein will enter into this particular or interact with this particular chaperone. There are very specific proteins that are handled or managed by these, uh, these systems. Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't, um, in my, my sort of initial response is that most of the proteins requiring something like this tend to be fairly hydrophobic. And so they're not easily processed on their own. There, there's enormous tendency for them to clump together, okay? So I think the, I don't know about this one, but I think the CTT, uh, in, uh, is in, involved with the folding of actin, okay? And actin is a cytoskeletal protein, so it forms these fibers that are very insoluble, so very hydrophobic, and they are spread out throughout the cell, allowing for things to move within the uh, interior of the cell from one site to another. Another one that is also folded by the CTT is um, a protein uh, that is put into a complex um, so, um, and is part of a receptor. So these receptors are hydrophobic and associate with and actually span the outer membrane of cells. So again, you need some special ways of moving things around given how hydrophobic they are. So anyway, um, yeah, it, it's a good question. I don't know if larger proteins require more of these versus smaller ones. That would be a possibility, but I, I honestly don't know. Other questions? Okay. Um, I want to talk uh, a minute about um, something related to the quiz. We'll, we'll come back and talk very briefly about uh, Alzheimer's, but uh, there are some, yes. Um, 
Yeah, so the, the question, question as I hear it is, if we, uh, let's say, introduce a gene, let's say a human gene into a bacterium or into an animal model of something, uh, are the chaperones there that are needed for folding? And my, ans my answer would be sometimes and sometimes not. So in some cases, um, if, you're, if you're going between, let's say, a mouse and a human, human and a mouse or something like that, there is, I would say, a higher likelihood that there will be a comparable um, chaperone present in, let's say, the mouse as is found in the human, sort of a homologue of that particular chaperone. Going from a human to, let's say, to, uh, to yeast or a bacteria, I think you may have to also introduce the chaperone that is critical for the folding. But if it's spontaneously folding, then it's less of an issue. Yes? Uh, you said that one of the functions of the chaperone was to target misfolded or aged proteins for like construction. Yeah. What causes a protein to age? Like why doesn't it last forever? Um, so circulating proteins are modified with time. Uh, they accumulate uh, what's called sialic acid. And as this accumulates, then they are removed. So if you have enough of the sialic acid, some others um, with time will misfold. So uh, even though the final three-dimensional structure is the low energy state for that, um, it is possible that you can have things unfold or be modified sufficiently that now they become sticky or they become in then they are often um, acted upon or they may interact with one of these chaperones ultimately they are uh, coupled to a, a compound called ubiquitin and that then targets them for the proteasome where they are broken down into individual amino acids and those products are, uh, of the breakdown are reused for synthesis of other proteins. So there is a certain turnover that happens for virtually all proteins. Okay, let me spend just a couple minutes talking about uh, prions. Prion protein uh, is a common protein. It is found in many tissues. Uh, it, uh, it, its function is still debated, so it doesn't necessarily have a clear defined function. But uh, under, ex under circumstances that are really not fully understood, uh, the, the sort of naturally occurring, the, the, uh, the, the appropriate uh, Bio, uh, biologically active form of this gets transformed into something called a pathologic prion. Um, so if you are looking at the slide here, on the left is just sort of our normal prion. And then on the right, we see that it's undergone a fairly dramatic change. You'll notice that suddenly you, you see the appearance of all of this beta sheeting. Now, beta sheeting in and of itself doesn't necessarily um, mean something bad, but one of the consequences of this change in conformation is that a hydrophobic side group is now presented on the surface of the protein. Um, and where that beta sheeting is taking place. As a consequence of those hydrophobic side groups being um, out interfacing with the liquid around it, there is a tendency for these to, uh, to actually form aggregates. And, then, and these aggregates can be a very extensive array of this pathologic prion protein. How the initial transformation takes place is unknown, but the secondary pathologic form of this is sufficiently stable that it doesn't immediately go back 
to its native form. Also, there is the sense that as you produce one copy of the pathologic prion protein, it has the ability to cause other copies of prion protein to adopt this abnormal pathologic structure. In other words, it can propagate the problem. And as these, uh, as you start to get aggregates of the prion protein, it starts to disrupt cells and it also disrupts the architecture of tissues and it ultimately leads to the death of the individual. This is called Creutzfeldt-Jakob uh, disease. And it's, uh, it's uniformly lethal. It usually transpires, the person goes from being seemingly healthy to, uh, to passing within a matter of a few weeks. It is a devastating disease. Its frequency is quite rare, thankfully. Uh, about one in a million people will develop this problem in the course of a year. There is a variant of this called mad cow disease or bo bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which again involves prion protein, but it doesn't follow the same pattern. It doesn't produce the same symptoms or signs or changes as observed with Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Uh, it is also lethal, but it takes a lot longer for a person to succumb to the disease. So there it's maybe a year to a year and a half on average that a person would uh, live with the disease before passing. Yes? How does something like this affect the psychology of passing person to person? Great question. It's unknown. Okay. Uh, obviously, if you, so one possible route of transmission is if you're a cannibal and you enjoy eating the brains of neighbors and friends, and one of them so, uh, just so happens to have this disease. Uh, this, this is actually has been observed in a, in a at least historically in a, a African tribe uh, that did this. But in terms of let's say BSC, the mad cow disease, it is thought that at least that variant in some way, shape or form can be acquired from the diet. And this is still a bit of a mystery because proteins are readily digested, broken down. They're not absorbed uh, from, the, uh, from the intestine, typically, unless you have a specialized receptor for them. Um, so almost all proteins that we eat, with a few exceptions, so uh, hair being one or shoe leather being another or bone, uh, if you eat almost any protein, it will be degraded all the way to amino acids in the gut very rapidly. There are a few that don't uh, get degraded that are very fibrous proteins, uh, but these don't get absorbed. So how does then you, how do you get this transmission? Well, the question is still an open question. It's really not known. Okay. Uh, there are some studies that suggest that there is retrograde transmission of this through neurons that interface with the, with the gut all the way to the brain, but it's, 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 a, it's, un, it's really unknown at this point how this happens. Okay, now there are many other diseases uh, that involve aggregations of proteins. And one of those is Alzheimer's disease. Um, this involves a different protein altogether. It's called amyloid beta protein. Uh, it is produced normally, but in um, individuals who develop Alzheimer's disease, it seems to be, uh, more of it seems to be produced and a particular peptide uh, of the amyloid beta precursor protein is produced that seems to be stickier in both of, in, and ultimately you form these plaques. Again, you find, you form uh, clusters, aggregates, some of these very large aggregates that disrupt the tissues, the cells, and then the tissues. 
leading to loss of transmission of electrical impulses, neural um, signals from one site to another in the body. This is a uh, Kreutzfeld Jakob. Um, this is what the brain looks like in one of these individuals. Those holes there are not typically there. This is a, this is indicates that just how uh, messed up, how disrupted the tissues are. And as this happens, obviously you can imagine that you lose the ability to control things uh, and you have uh, you have everything from psychological problems to neuromuscular problems to uh, uh, paralysis and, and so forth. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to stop now and, and go uh, to the board. We're going to leave then chapter four and we're going to start talking about uh, Protein, proteins interacting with other molecules. And um, the one that we are going to spend the oops, most time with is uh, proteins interacting with oxygen. Okay, so uh, hemoglobin and myoglobin. But uh, we're going to start by just this, uh, by first of all, defining a couple things. So. If you have a molecule, a small molecule of another peptide even binding to or uh, being, yeah, being bound to a protein, we refer to that smaller molecule, the one bound to the protein as a ligand, okay? To ligate means to tie things together. So in this sense, we are tying the, uh, the small molecule or smaller molecule to the surface, to a place on the protein itself. And so you can think of this. So uh, if we just consider this in just sort of uh, chemical terms, we have this equilibrium between free protein and free ligand and this protein ligand complex, okay? This is just by way of definition. So this represents an equilibrium and we can describe this. So this is, an association uh, equilibrium constant, and we would define it in this fashion. This hopefully looks a little familiar from, uh, from those hazy days of chemistry, your first year. But this just then is an equilibrium expression for the binding of ligand to protein. Okay, anybody have any issues with this so far? We're going to talk now about another concept, and that is what, uh, what this process sort of looks like uh, in terms of if we have a constant amount of, um, if we have a constant amount of protein, but a variable amount of ligand, what do we see, okay? And what we would see normally is something like this. We would see, that we would, um, if this is the percent um, of protein that has ligand present, in other words, the fraction of, of uh, protein that is binding ligand, this is a saturation curve. And, and so it, it means that we, are going to, as we increase ligand, we will get up to a point where this will be one, that is every copy of protein will have a copy of ligand on it if we get to high enough ligand concentrations. This curve obviously depends on how, how tightly that binding is. If it's really tight binding, this curve might go up more steeply. Uh, it's still going to reach the same max if it has weak binding, it may take longer for us to achieve the same saturation of the protein. So this, this concept of the fraction of protein with ligand on it is called in our book, theta, okay? So let me just give you a sort of a math 
definition of this. So theta represents that portion of protein that has ligand on it over the total protein, which is a representation of both free and occupied protein. So this is both states in which we can have protein. This is the state in which ligand is bound to it. So this represents the fraction with ligand on. Okay. All right, we're gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit of manipulation here. I'm going to rearrange this <clears throat> so that I'm going to solve for PL. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this term over here and let me rewrite this now. PL is equal to Ka. This is not an acid equilibrium constant. This is an association constant. And this is going to be, e oops, this is going to be KAP and L. <clears throat> and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute this PL in to this equation for theta. And so this ends up looking like this, K-A-P-L <clears throat> over P plus, again, I have P-L, so K-A-P-L. Okay, we have P in all of these terms, so they can be factored out and canceled out. <clears throat> So this simplifies somewhat to KAL over one plus KAL. Now I'm going to divide top and bottom by KA. This will leave me with L over one divided by KAL. It turns out that if you, if you look at the, uh, if we go back to this original equation here describing the association of P with L, there's also a dissociation of PL back to P and L. It turns out that the KD dissociation and the KA are reciprocals one of the other. Consequently, this, um, can be expressed as follows. So theta equals L, the ligand concentration, KD, the dissociation constant, and L again, ligand concentration. This is called the Hill equation. So you might want to keep track of the Hill equation. Um, We'll talk more next time about some of the significance of this, but one of the things that is important is that this KD is a measure of how tightly bound a ligand is. So the stronger the binding, the smaller the KD. The less, the less, of, the, the less of this will go back to the individual free components. Yes? It's, it, it looks somewhat similar, but it is really not. This is, we're not really talking about rates of reaction here or, but we are talking about just sort of this concept of things binding one to another, okay? Someone else had a hand up or thought? Yes? So is the Hill, the Hill equation, is that referring specifically to the dissociation? It is theta equals L over KD plus L, okay? And this is its derivation. You won't have to derive it, but you should know what it is. We'll talk more about its significance. <clears throat> so it turns out that uh, the, you can actually, the KD be, can be calculated by knowing the point at which half of the protein has ligand on it. And uh, so these would have, these three would have <clears throat> different KDs. 
This one would be an would have a smaller KD indicating tighter binding. This one would have a larger KD indicating weaker binding. So remember, KD represents this process where you're losing ligand from protein. And so the tighter is bound, um, the smaller the KD. It's a little non-intuitive, but that's... KD is, a, is, a, uh, a is something that is determined time and time again. It is, it is a critical value. If you ever want to develop a drug that acts uh, by binding to a protein, you absolutely need to know the KD of that interaction so that you can prescribe the right amount of drug to, to be beneficial without being toxic. Okay, we need to quit. Any final questions? Yes. One question about the pests. Uh, it's used to quarantine. What, what should they do? They should contact me and I don't know what I'll do, but I'll, we'll figure something out. We can work it out, but I, I'm just not, I don't have a single answer or simple answer for them. So. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Be safe, please.